Hello and welcome to the 42 Rugby Show. The All Blacks are in town and we await the dreaded Blacklash. Steve Hansen's men out for revenge after a 40-29 defeat to Ireland in Chicago. And joining us to look at Ireland's prospects is former Munster and Leicester wing Johnny Murphy. Now in this episode, we're going to briefly look back at Ireland's win over Canada and talk about some of the exciting new faces in the team. We'll look at Ireland's selection for this huge second All Blacks clash and we'll take on the easy task of putting together an Ireland game plan for, for, for this second second match. Johnny, first of all, before we get into Ireland, um, you're back w- with Nace now up in Division 1B, four wins out of seven. How have things been going so far this season? Yeah, it's been pretty good so far. Um, there was a big adjustment for the lads to kind of step up in pace uh, from 2A to 1B. But yeah, look, really enjoying it. Fionn uh, Carr came back to us this year, so we've got a good good bunch of lads, all local from the Kildare area, trying to push the club forward. So disappointing one for us this weekend down in Dolphin, but um, look, we're still in the hunt, fifth at the moment, so if we can kick on, win our last two games before Christmas, uh, we're right in the mix going forward into next year. So exciting to see you got like Fionn back in the club game, we probably need to see more of it. Understand also that he's going to be involved with Ireland Sevens this year, which is really exciting. What does a guy like that bring to, to club rugby? Um, it just brings the experience, you know, when there's, you know, when you're playing against uh, guys, you know, we're up at a level now where we're playing against, you know, academy guys, uh, development guys, you know, the, you know, the two Connacht sides are in with us. So when we played Gold Regions and Buccaneers, they had, you know, between development and uh, academy contracts, they had 10, 12 guys playing who were contracted to Connacht. So it just gives you that experience, the lads feel, uh, you know, you can rely on Fionn to, to step up at the right time and it's really important, you know, I think, you know, when I spoke to Fionn about coming back, he was really excited for our club hopefully going forward and, you know, to stay in Division 1, B or, you know, even in the next couple of years, there's still a lot of nice guys in 1A playing, so, if, you know, we can consolidate or even push forward in the playoff this year to try and get five, six of those guys playing at the top level back. It's going to be very good for the club in the future. Yeah, and you're still tipping away yourself at outside centre? I am try, trying. I got six stitches in the back of my head for my <laughs> sins this weekend. But yeah, look, really enjoying it. I'm playing with guys like Fionn that I played with in school. And uh, yeah, it's real rugby again, you know, enjoying the bus trips back home and stuff. So it's, yeah, it's great fun. Exactly, real rugby. At international level, Ireland, of course, had eight new caps against Canada. Really exciting for the, for the squad and the depth of Irish rugby, which was probably the key point after last. World Cups um, exit in the quarterfinal that they didn't have that depth, so it looks to be building. Amongst those eight new caps, who were the guys that maybe stood out to you? Yeah, you know, well, I think you know James. Um, obviously, he's a former Nace guy himself, so it's great to see, uh, great to see for us him making his debut. But it's been a long journey for James. You know, when he was in Newbridge College, he was a loose head prop. He got you know changed across by Joe uh, to Hooker, and I think it's it's really important that um, you know for him and his development that. You know that he got that cap at the weekend. He's been playing very well. Um, he probably lacked some opportunity under Matt O'Connor for whatever reason. And I think the last you know 18 months under Leo, he's really progressed in the right right direction. So he came on. He carried very well. He did his basics. You know, his scrum and line out w- w- went according to plan. And to get over in the line, it was a it was a great day for him and a nice day for his family after. Yeah, even a nice little offload at one stage. A couple of the other guys stood out. We we did a bit of analysis on Gary Ringrose. If anyone wants to check that out. Thought he was intelligent again, no surprise really. He looks no. like a guy who's going to have a long test career. We saw Jack O'Donoghue have a nice few kind of muscular moments. Maybe didn't get the ball in hand as much as he wanted and would have been disappointed with that little set piece play off the scrum close mm. to, the, to the, the Canadian try line. But again, another guy who impressed. These guys look now coming out of Vince Roby like they're more ready for that step up. I know it's Canada, we can't get too excited about it, but they look ready. Yeah, well, a lot of these guys are getting high in Cup experience, which, you know, was the closest thing to test level. And, you know, they're they're playing away in France and, you know, they're they're playing on big occasions in Thoman Park, you know, in a, you know, in the Aviva Christmas and, and those things, they're they're really important. It's, it's all experience. And when the lads step up to the top level, um, you know, it's just that little bit of pace that they have to get used to, and you know they're all they're all flying through it at the moment. But I think going back to what you said about building a squad, you look at our front row, which we've probably been probably a small bit short in the past years. You know, you've got someone like Dave Kilcoyne, you know, who's probably third choice loose head at the moment, but like he's playing the rugby of his of, of his career. Mm, it's an exceptional carry. And 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 I think, you know, w- with the tight heads we have, you know, we've got three really really solid front row pairings that. You know, who would have thought that four or five years ago, back in the days of, you know, where, you know, we lost the Munster front row of old, 
we were going to be struggling. And I, and I think that's probably, you know, one of the things Joe has really, really developed, especially uh, since the World Cup. And, you know, it, it credit that, you know, the lads put on such a good show on the, this weekend against Canada. Yeah, fantastic to see that front row developing. John Ryan as well, we should mention, coming off the bench and, and destroying the scrum, one push over, push over try. His transformation has been superb. Ireland moving on to All Blacks now. I don't think too many of these guys are going to feature, but they'll be somewhere down the line, hopefully. We can't dwell too much on this game tactically because it was a, a second string side thrown together. But one of the things we did want to pick out was Ireland's play in the 22. Very direct, some brilliant ball carrying, which is understandable. You need to do that in the opposition 22. But maybe a few instances like this one where they, where they just missed a bit of space on the outside edge. Does there need to be a greater awareness, do you think, in, in the Irish side of, of these opportunities? Well, I think Joe's big thing in terms of um, the 22 attack is, you know, you get up, you get on your feet and you beat teams up around the corner. Then I think what you said is really important. It's about the decision making at that time. You might get against the better sides, you're going to get this picture once and you need to take it. You need to take that opportunity. And I think that relies on the communication out the back, but then the players in the correct position at the right time. So I think if you see here, you know, you've got Craig Gilroy um, where Paddy Jackson would normally be, but Paddy's yeah, after Paddy. carrying. Craig needs to feel when, and if you, you watch it live, um, if you watch it on replay, you see that Craig comes from this position and he gets in here. Yeah. He needs to then communicate that he needs the ball. Get Johnny Ryan just literally to stand, deliver back out, and then it's an easy one pass play for Marshall to go over in the corner or any one of the four. And I think that's, that's something that they just need to develop. Joe is obviously probably going to show him multiple opportunities like this that they created and then it's just about communicating at the right time because on Saturday they're only going to maybe get to see that picture once yeah. and if they don't take it that's seven points gone. Yeah because on the very next phase Walton Land does actually score but again you can see the space and there's almost a risk of going into that contact yeah it's brilliant to see Walton Land backing his physical freakishness which we also mm. saw with his line break in, in the first half but it's about having that that awareness I think and as you say against a better team you're only going to get that chance so much. I think it's a collective issue. Like you saw the guys out wide, they were communicating in. That communication is also about guys listening as well. Yeah. And I know that's incredibly tough in a test match. It was quite loud in the Aviva Stadium and it'll probably be even louder against the All Blacks. Yeah. But. but something that can really help Craig there is actually if, I, I think it was, um, it's, probably, uh, it's probably Luke Marshall, Marshall yeah. um, is if he just takes one small step back, that means their alignment is like this. So it just makes it easier when you're in that position there that Craig can look and see that there's enough depth in the line and he can trust that it's literally just a stand and deliver pass yeah. like John Ryan gave to him. So there's probably a few collections. You see there's a flat line outside Craig, which at times in that split moment, you just feel, oh, I'm not going to be able to get the ball there in time. So okay. if they just have a small bit of depth, there's a collective issue. But I think one of the most important things to say is probably the second part of communication is listening to those calls and making sure that they actually go through on the pitch. Yeah, then. and we shouldn't talk down the carrying from Ireland. It was, it was really high quality, I thought. Obviously, again, you're playing Canada, but guys like Healy, Kilcoyne, Tracy, when he came off the bench, they were exceptional at ball carrying. And Alton Delan, of course, man of the match. Um, but lots of encouraging stuff in that Canada game. We'll come back maybe to, to some of that link passing because it's could feature against the All Blacks, but first of all, we want to talk about that, that team selection for Ireland um, in this game. We uh, have a few big decisions to make uh, from, well, from Joe Schmidt does anyway. Where do you think the changes are going to be from that first All Blacks match, if any? I don't, I, I personally don't see any changes um, to, the, to the starting 15. Uh, I think it's going to be very hard to drop anyone from that starting 15, especially with the, the, the kind of balance that they have coming off the bench, you know. Yeah. Um, so you're talking Josh? Van der Fier starting Fire, Murphy. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that, that, that might be something that they might look at, either you know, Sean O'Brien or Pete, and maybe keeping Josh van der Flyer on, um, on the bench. But you know, when Josh came on, he played very well. So um, you know, and having an out-and-out -out seven on the pitch, like you know, what Josh van der Flyer is against New Zealand, is something that, that works probably to your strength. Um, so I'd see probably the changes maybe on the bench. You know, there's obviously a back row spot up, up, uh, up for grabs, and then maybe the the last two back positions. You know, you, you might think that um, you know Paddy Jackson come back in for Joey Carberry, and then maybe Keith Earls comes back in for for Gary Ringrose purely just on an experience level alone. Um, I think you know trying to beat the All Blacks for the second time in three weeks. You know, to have that experience coming off the bench, and then also you know. Erzy's versatility means that if someone goes down in the back three, he can slot in there straight away. 
but also he can slot in straight into the centre if if needs be with the options that they have in the in, you know in the uh, in the starting fifteen already. Yeah, it, it certainly makes sense what you're saying. There are definitely going to be close calls in that though. I think Joe Schmidt after the Canada match even mentioned the front row. There's guys pushing. Keen Healy, 17 carries, really explosive performance against Canada, but it's impossible to jo drop Jack McGrath. I think yeah. at this stage he's he's world class. I want to just look at that second row briefly. Alton Delan, first start for Ireland, really, really outstanding performance against Canadians. He's just so explosive. But what does Donica Ryan bring, maybe in, in contrast to Alton Delan? I suppose he gives you, for me, he gives you that balance. You know that that Devon has allowed to control the line out, um, and then you know. Donica gives you the, that dark arts work, you know, that no one really sees. That is really important from your second second row, and I think to have Ulton coming off the bench just adds that extra carrying option um, for for the whole squad, and and he can kind of lift it. And I think Donner's probably just warrants that start because of, you know. Uh, the New Zealanders are going to have their two second rows back, and I think it's important that you know they have that physical edge. Obviously, Ulton showed at the weekend that he he carries extremely well, but it's those dark arts, you know, in the second row, and the, um, that you know Dunners does extremely well, and I I think that probably just gives him the edge, just at, at this present time in Ulton for, for that start. Yeah, um, Ian Henderson obviously is back fit, but it just seems. To out of character, it will be out of character for Ireland to, to put him yeah. in there. And I think it's a big call given that you know he's been injured for a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, I think trying to get up to the speed of the game yeah. might be just a bit much. And he is a guy who sometimes takes a while to get up there. Yeah, exactly. So you know, it's probably just a, ste a step too far. But great to have him coming back into the mix, probably going forward next week. Yeah, I think Keith Earls will be cursing that suspension for the tip tackle against mm. Glasgow because it looked like he was going to be the starter against the All Blacks. Simon Zebo obviously had an outstanding game, possibly his best for for Ireland. So. Again, it's hard to see him dropping that, particularly with the aerial game going to be key. Yeah, and I think that that is something that the lads controlled. You know, they, they won the kick kick battle over in yeah. Chicago, they won the aerial battle, and I think that's something that is going to be really, really important going into this weekend. Um, I think Earlsey's back to the form, you know, that, that he was in, you know, a couple of years ago. He yeah. just seems really content on the pitch. Um, you know, he has that elect you know, that electricity that when he comes on the pitch he can just do something out of out of nothing. I think it was, you know, himself and D T Van der Merver were like they were having a game on their own at the yeah. weekend. And uh, you know, he's just he just adds something, you know, mm. and he's He's a real tough nut as well, mm. so he's not going to shy away from anything. So, yeah, he was very unlucky with, with what happened that day against, um, you know, Glasgow, and and you know, he probably would, you know, would have warranted a starting spot last week in Chicago. But, you know, I certainly see him being involved this weekend and hopefully coming off the bench and doing a job to close out the game. Yeah, he's been really fiery, big fend against Canada. Yeah. Always good to see. Yeah. So it seems unlikely that there are going to be too many changes in the team. We don't know exactly what the game plan is going to be, but. Again, they're going to have to have those pillars of really strong defence, really amazing work rate that they had in Soldier Field. The defensive side of the game is going to be key. They conceded four tries. You always concede tries against the All Blacks. I think you have to accept that. But what are the maybe those pillars that they need to have defensively again? I think it was a real kind of ballsy effort from from the lads. They there was two on one, um, two on ones on the edge a couple of times, and especially in the second half, you see Andy Trimble come in and put the ball player under pressure to say, "If you're good enough." execute and not very many teams do that against the All Blacks because it's a bit of a gamble and I really think that you know the lads believed in what their defensive structure was going to do and put them under pressure that they haven't been put under before and those passes didn't go to hand. One went to touch, one landed on, his, um, on the back of his shoulder which held him up so they managed to push him into touch so I think they need to develop that another bit and they need to have that belief that they can do it for you know for a second week and um, for that, they need to fill the pitch, and then they really need to trust that if 15 has last man, 15 is going to get last man. And I think that's that's something that if they do, like they did in Chicago, I, I really think they can shut shut the All Blacks down. And I think their goal is probably to concede less again. You, yeah. know, you had a, um, a piece saying that you know the average, you know, six tries in the last 10 games, and I think you know target was. Let's get below that and see where we're at. I think now they need to have a target of, right, we're going to shut them out maybe for two or three and then see where we're at from there. Yeah, Andy Farrell will lead that. He's had a massive influence. We, we obviously don't see behind the scenes, but I, I get the sense that he is that kind of emotional driver as well. You lose Paul O'Connell, you get Andy Farrell in. I know it's not exactly the same kind of role, but he seems to be that big personality behind the squad as well. Defensively, he's brought this, this line speed. We, we talk about line speed all the time. 
Can you maybe just talk us through what a team needs to have in their defensive structure to, to be able to bring that? that well, I think it's really important that, one, you have your backfield cover. Um, you know, that, that allows trust in your front line to get off the line. Your backfield cover, and one of the most important per, per, uh, people in, in, your, um, in the backfield cover is actually your nine. Not a lot of people realise that. So Murray's um, communication in behind the line and also his vision to plug holes that, that when mm. they're needed, let's get in. And then that's another, uh, another, um, another set... Uh, Another body in the line, which After he does that, really well. Which he, he does very, you very well. You see him come in and make, really, and because he's such a big guy, yeah. impact tackles. And he just controls that area extremely well. His communication is very, very clear, and you always know when he's in, when he's out, and, and it's very, very important for for the whole defensive line. After that, then it's about spacing. You need to first of all your foundation D, your pillar, whatever you call it, your guard, your bodyguard, your two, your three, yeah. your ten, twenty. Well, you know, uh, those three guys inside. Those three guys inside. So it's this person here, here, and here. And it's the communication of that then. You know, whoever sets your line speed in your system, be it 30 or 40 or 3 or 4, which is generally this guy, everyone comes with him. And it's really important that everyone buys into that, stay in each other's heel and then push them up the field. But it's really important if you're going to bring line speed that you know where the ball is at all times. If I don't know where the ball is and I'm just shooting up at a man, the ball can just go across me and that then leaves dog legs. Probably if you see their first try, probably something that Robbie got a small bit, he, he kind of ball watched a slight, slight just outside um, Jared Payne and then he just got stuck trying to correct himself last minute when he realised he got stuck on, on the line speed. Yeah. So if you get those things right, you will shut them down. Okay, really interesting. and, and we'll. Look forward to seeing a bit more of that from Ireland, putting that pressure back on the All Blacks. Not as, a lot of sides hadn't done that this season. They'd yeah. kind of sat off, or especially on the edge. You mentioned Andrew Himble come up and, and make them make that decision. We saw against Australia a couple of times where Hayley Petty or, or guys like that on the outside edge just sat off, just sat off. Mm. And once they have that space to make those decisions, yeah. game because over. they have the ball, they're so used to playing with the ball in two hands. It's the basic. They do the basics so so well. If you give them time on the ball, they'll execute every time. Or you put them under pressure and say. I want you to execute, then it's a, it's a bit of a different story. And I think that's probably what, um, what Ireland did extremely well over in Chicago. They put them under, under pressure, they backed themselves in those wider channels. And that all, com that all comes from your inside D, we've spoken about. Andy Farrell stepped up the line speed. He's, you know, he's backed up the really good work that Les Kiss has done over the, the last number of years. And we spoke about you know, when they were in South Africa, it enables then, if they do have massive numbers, because you've br brought so much line speed at these guys, it means these two guys can taper off on the edge, use the touch line, and they end up with a rook here. But as you see, there's no gain yeah. line. You've eaten they, that space midfield. You've eaten that space up in, in, in the middle of the pitch. They've gone past, past, but out wide, it looks like they're playing all the rugby, but they're actually just playing in between the two 10 metre lines, which is yeah. exactly what you want them to do. Those guys in midfield, obviously, a lot of decision making pressure on them as well. Just for the, the New Zealand tries, it's tiny little things. It's a tiny disconnect. Two guys, maybe a lack of communication or even a lack of <laughs> telepathic understanding. Yeah. Or he's going to go. I need to go as well. So you and just need to be tuned in for exactly. Maybe. And that was the thing with you know with Robbie, Robbie Henshaw and Jared Payne for the first try. It, for the first try, it was he copped it, but just that split second too late. And then he tried to correct his feet, and then he he ended up falling over. And I think they were then unlucky. Obviously, the ball ricocheting off, off um, New Zealanders' head and then CJ getting taken out by Murray and different things. So it just let itself. It was kind of a comedy of errors for you know three or four errors in the space of two or three seconds and they end up getting over over in the corner. A lot of chat this week about kicking. Um, the All Blacks kicked 13 times against Ireland in Chicago, which was down on their seasonal average of 22.5. They do, they do kick quite a lot. As you said earlier on before we came in, the best teams in the world do. Ireland do kick a lot. They had 29 kicks in Chicago. Last weekend against Italy, the All Blacks kicked 38 times. And I, I just get the sense that it was almost a, a practicing of the game plan for Ireland, that they're going to look to, to take that kick battle to Ireland um, and to win it because Ireland stood out in that area. What do, you, what do you think of the keys are for Ireland in terms of dealing what, with what looks like it's going to be a, a bigger kicking threat from well, the backs? I think w being able to bring line speed is a massive thing because you're building on your backfield cover, like you've already spoken about, uh, you know, Murray's role there, but also then the command in the air. You know, we've got a back three at the moment that is up there with the best in the world. You see, you know, Simon Zebo's catch over, actually over someone at the weekend. It was like he should have been playing for the Chicago Bulls rather than playing rugby. He like jumped over a man to catch a ball. It was incredible. Rob Kearney, that's one of his strengths. All, 
throughout his whole career is the area is the aerial battle. And I think if you can win that, that just then breeds confidence in your defensive line. You know then, as if you're in the front line, you've run up, rushed them, they've kicked the ball back. You then know all I need to do is get back and support because I don't have to worry about the ball being the ball hitting the deck for one, or just get back and support because I know one of the back three guys is going to catch it for a start. What about those guys in front? The area battle, let's say it's happening back here, it's going to be a one on one. How important are the guys in front of the ball? It's probably one of the subtleties of modern rugby and another form of legalised cheating where they're blocking bodies. Is that something that players in front of the ball need to be very aware of? And it's something that, you know, is is very important. You need to escort the people back, but in a, in a legal way, as you say. So it's very important if this guy is running here in between these two guys, don't turn that way. Turn in and then chase the ball back. It's just that slight change of direction putting off a chaser off his line, which means he can't get up in the air. And it's that when you're chasing a ball, it's probably one of the hardest um, things to do on the rugby pitch is catch a Gary Owen running forward, an attacking kick, but it's such a momentum change for you when you're going forward. But if, and I know for myself, if, if someone gives you a tiny little nudge, even five, ten yards away from where the ball is, it's very hard to get your feet in the correct position to go up and really, really contest. Okay. And I think that's very important for, for the lads, that they get those escort lines correctly, um, uh, correctly shepherd them into an area where they're not going to be able to compete in the air. Just in terms of, of the individual technique of the catch, what are your little cues coming towards that ball? I think it's very important that you try and meet the ball. It's not a case that you're waiting for the ball, you're waiting for it. You have to be able to control your feet in a way that you can get those two, three little steps in just when the ball is at its optimum height and you go forward and you meet the ball. It's really important that if there is going to be a collision in the air that you win that collision. So sometimes the technique, I remember Jordy Murphy used to always say to me that it's really important to try and catch the ball on your back shoulder. So if you go up, I'm left footed, so if I go up for the ball, I'm aiming to catch it on my back shoulder. So if we collide, I can still take the ball with me down rather than trying to catch it on my front shoulder and you coll you we collide in the air, but I'm ended up, I'm ended up in this position. Yeah. So it's those little things, but the lads will have the pad out this weekend, they'll know the importance of the battle, and they'll be, it's a skill that actually not a lot of people know, but it's practiced a huge amount, because the kick-kick battle is so important, and it can swing momentum, you know, and I, and I think, as I said already, to win a ball going forward, like Simon Zebo d did in Chicago, it raises everyone, and it also goes, it, they are, it puts the opposition under pressure, so it's another way of building pressure on the opposition. Just last one on that kicking, one of the greatest examples of a, of a good kick from Ireland was in the final few minutes before Robbie Henshaw's try. They go to the width and Simon Zebo kicks long, keeps it in field, pressurised, smash him into touch. In terms of that kind of kicking, which the All Blacks do very well generally, they didn't do any of it really in Chicago. What are the kind of cues that the kicking team is looking for? You're trying to manipulate the backfield. Like there, they were expecting probably Joey Carby to kick off first set of hands, and they were set then where the 15 was set back to, you know, just to control the backfield as he normally would. When you move the ball out wide and you have, you know, you have two left foot options in Rob and in Simon to be able to put the ball down, down, down the trams close to the touchline, just builds that pressure even more because the 15 has to engage the line. Most defensive systems mean um, run a system where the 15 has last man. So if Simon's the last man, I have to go forward and try and make the tackle. You're after putting, so you close here, it's exactly like this, you close this, you're putting a huge amount of pressure on your blindside winger to get across and cover all this space on his own. Um, and I think that just manipulating the backfield using Exiting on your terms is something that Ireland, and at the weekend, they did it very well. Okay, it was against Canada, but you saw in their 22, they moved the ball very well in their 22, and then when at the right times, they kicked when they needed to. And I think that's something that they need to continue developing throughout, uh, th throughout this week and then into Saturday where they can, like that, build pressure on the All Blacks. Pressure is pressure. It affects everyone, and it's not something that they can get away from just because they're one of the best sides in the world. If you keep building pressure, eventually they will crack. Yeah, that kick battle is going to be absolutely massive. Great insight. Thanks very much. In terms of the All Blacks, they're going to be better. Simply put, they're going to be better. They're going to change up. They'll have Retallick in the second row, the best second row in the world probably. He'll fix their line out a little bit. Sam Hoylar looks like looks like he's nearly fit. Uh, Anton Linner Brown in the midfield who 
it was probably unfortunate to miss out in the Chicago game. He came back against Italy and we saw his playmaking ability, his offloading, which will be particularly important without Ryan Crotty. I think they badly missed him. Joe Schmidt mentioned again this week that the All Blacks badly missed his, I don't know, stewardship of that mm -hmm. midfield, his, his intelligence on the ball and defensively as well. So even those three changes, Israel Dag probably on the right wing for that aerial battle we've mm -hmm. just spoken about, they're going to be much improved. Basically put, what chance do you give of Ireland of, of repeating what they've done? Um, I actually give them a pretty good chance. Um, I think long, long gone are the days that you know New Zealand come to town and, and you know it's going to be great for 70 minutes or even three years ago, 77 minutes and however many seconds. I think it's now is and especially after you know the Chicago win, the All Blacks are under pressure. You know it's not very often that they're they're going to lose a series to Ireland, essentially, if they don't produce. If Ireland can stick with them, build that pressure the whole way throughout the game, and then in the last 10 minutes, really try and do what they did in Chicago. New Zealand were on top for 20 minutes in the second half. When they got within four points, every Irish person around the world was like, oh, here we go again, this is it, it's gone. But Ireland kicked it up another level, so they showed they can do it, and I think it's really important that they stick with them, stay, keep it at a one-score game, and as I said, building that pressure, New Zealand are under a huge amount of pressure from back home already. You know, they're not going to get away with, uh, you know, the press back home. Probably only one or two journalists gave them a bit of stick, but everyone's, oh, it's great for Ireland. It's that kind of stuff. You know, they took it very well. If they lose twice in in three weeks, there's going to be a lot of questions asked. And I think it's really, really important that they build that pressure and use that to Ireland's advantage on Saturday. Okay, so maybe sum up where the two teams are now coming into this second game. I think that, you know, Ireland are obviously on a bit of a crest of a wave, but I think New Zealand, you know, the reaction back home, majority of it was, oh, it's great that Ireland won. They, they took their loss extremely well, but I don't think they're going to get away with it if it happens to, you know, two out of three weeks. Um, and I think Ireland need to use that to, to their advantage. Pressure is pressure. It affects absolutely everyone. And I think if they can stick with them and then in the last, you know, last 10 minutes really plant that seed of doubt, then, you know, like they did in Chicago, the All Blacks were completely on top for 20 minutes of the second half. But Ireland stood it up in the last five minutes. They brought it to a level that probably the All Blacks weren't expecting that Ireland had. And, you know, I think Robbie's trying in the end. They just need to, to build that pressure again keep with them, keep it at one score game, and then in the last kind of five, six minutes like they did, really kick on. Because the All Blacks, they are under a bit of scrutiny here. And, uh, and uh, they're going to practically, they're going to lose a test series to Ireland. First time ever if they don't get a result this weekend. So I think it's really, really important that Ireland use that to their advantage. What does it mean for Irish rugby? So if we get this second win against the All Blacks, an unthinkable thing coming into this this series, as I say, what, what would that mean for Irish rugby? It, it, it's it's already changed already w with with that win with the win over in Chicago. They've you know they've they made history already. But to beat them twice in three weeks, it means that they never have to be scared of them ever again. They they've beaten everyone now. They know what they can what they're capable of, and they can build forward to the Six Nations with you know. England are going very well, and people, because we're going so well in Ireland at the moment, people aren't really talk Irish people. We're not really talking about how good the English are, and you know, it just if we beat the All Blacks this weekend, the English are going to start thinking about us. We don't have to think about them because we'll run our shop, they'll run, our, and then it's going to be a great, great occasion here in in February, or March. But I think it's really important that we start to believe now that we belong in the top one, two, three in the world, and and um, that. The win, a win this weekend is really going to kick that forward. Could be another defining moment for Irish rugby. Johnny, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks everyone for joining us and we'll catch you early next week, hopefully to reflect on another Irish win. Cheers.